celebrate the resurrection of our God. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for what you did on the cross that day. Lord, we remember the suffering that you went through, Father. We remember how you died and how you rose again, Father. And we just, we just want to praise you this morning for all you are and what you did, Father. We thank you. We love you. Oh, oh, oh. 
Is our living hope, amen. He is our living hope because He is alive. We are born anew. 
we are born again into his life, into his hope, into his transformation. We have been adopted into his family. We are called children of God. It is our opportunity right now to join together to receive communion. So whether you're at home right now or wherever you might be, I would encourage you, if you have the communion elements, go ahead and prepare them now. If you don't have them, go ahead and grab them and get them ready. Some of you may have these already prepared communion cups, and go ahead and prepare those as well. You'll open up the top and take the wafer off the top, and then we'll also peel back this as well. So I'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and prepare that and we will receive communion together. Isn't it beautiful to be able to be a part of God's body, a part of the body of Christ, even though we're not able to be together and sit here together? We are one, unified, as we receive communion today. And I want to read to you Jesus establishing this communion with his disciples in Luke chapter 22. It says that, he had entered into the city, and they had prepared a, a place for him to receive the Passover. And he said that he had earnestly desired to eat this Passover with them before he suffers. And he told them, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup when he had given thanks. He said, take this and share it amongst yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God. Come. So when we drink in remembrance of his blood spilled for us and body broken for us, we are also declaring that the kingdom of God has come here on earth. And we pray as it is in heaven. And then in verse 19, it says, And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread, and it's, would you just, whatever you have, whether it's a wafer or a cracker or Reese's peanut butter cups, I don't know what you're using, but would you just break it as a symbol of his body broken for us? Thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross for us, that your body was broken for me. Is broken for all of us. Our sin drove you to the cross. And the punishment that we deserve, you bore in your body. We will not forget. We thank you. And we love you. Let's receive this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 20 says this, In the same way he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. His blood poured out for us, symbolizing life that he gave so that we could be alive in him he spilled his lifeblood for us so that we could become alive would you raise up your cup or your glass or whatever you may have in your hand and say this simple prayer thank you Jesus for your blood allow it to cleanse me and purify me and wash me as white as snow I will not forget your sacrifice. We love you, Jesus. 
We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's drink. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just take 10 seconds and tell them, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you have adopted me into your family, that I belong to you, that I was dead and now I'm alive. I was lost, now I am found. And we thank you for it. We love you, God. We love you. Let's continue to worship the Lord together.
give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor belongs to you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you resurrected us, that you gave us new life in you, Jesus, that we belong to you, God, because of your sacrifice, because of your death on the cross and the resurrection from the dead, God, that you are alive forevermore, and because of that, God, we have life, we have hope. We have promise of an eternity with you. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor belongs to you, Jesus. All the praise, all the glory, all the honor belongs to you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your sacrifice, God. And we celebrate the fact that you are alive and forevermore alive. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Oh, God, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor belongs to you, Jesus. Isn't God good? The worship 
of our God is so essential and powerful and it's so good to be in his presence. We're going to take a moment to transition the service right now, but if you're watching online on YouTube or Facebook, go ahead and leave a comment right now or throw up some worship hands saying, hey, I'm worshiping the Lord right with you. Let us know where you're watching from, who you're watching with, and uh, as we make this transition, make sure that you're doing a shout out. Uh, you can shout us out on at CBC Madeira on Instagram and Facebook as well, and you can be a part of what we're doing here. We love you, and we'll be right back. Hey, church, happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter to all of you who are watching uh, all over. Uh, could you do a, a quick favor and give us, let us know, give us a shout out uh, online right now. Let us know who's watching, who you're watching with, where you're watching from. And uh, we just wanted to thank you for joining us. You literally could be watching anybody, anywhere, at any time. And you're here with us, you're joining with us. And we're so grateful that we are a part of a family and a body of Christ here um, in Madera Central Valley Church. And we wanted to remind you that you have the ability to... Uh, to continue to give uh, to the church, even though we are not meeting in this building. And uh, you can give uh, right on the, um, with the information that's right there on your screen. You can text in to give. You can give directly online, or you can even mail in to the address there shown on the screen. We just want to say thank you for continuing to partner with us so that we can spread the good news of Jesus in, throughout our community, meet needs that are there, and show the love of Jesus to people who are in need. And so we thank you for that. We also want to remind you about our Zoom community groups. This is our opportunity and chance to meet together and to see each other, even though we can't see each other face to face. We can still see each other uh, online or even listen to each other's voices. You can call in if you don't have uh, internet access or to access to a computer where you have a, a camera screen. You can actually still call in and be a part of that. So if you want more information, go ahead and. and uh, Give us a, a message right now or DM us um, in Facebook or on Instagram, and we'll get you plugged in. We'll give you all the information you need for that so that you can still be a part of the body of Christ, even though you are not uh, able to join with us uh, this morning. And so we're going to get into the Word right now, and I'm so excited. I love Easter. I love Resurrection Sunday. That's the most powerful, most wonderful, most awe-inspiring Sunday because we remember what Jesus has done for us, and it's good to do it. It's good to be here with all of you online, and so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, and um, you know, I, I really do miss, I miss all of you. I miss seeing you and, and being able to hug and shake hands and, and be there, and uh, it's true, uh, the saying, the heart, uh, distance makes the heart grow fonder, and my, my heart is so much more fonder of you guys right now. It's so much more. It was pretty fond already. It's more fond now. It's fonder. And, um, and so I just want, I wish I could reach out and touch you. And obviously we are able to see each other uh, on Zoom, but it's different seeing each other face to face, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, it, it's good to be able to hear each other's voices and, and see each other's faces, but there's just nothing like seeing you face to face. Um, and I thank God for all the technology that we have and FaceTime and, and Zoom and um, Marco Polo, those are all great things that allow us to stay connected, but I wish I could see your face. You can see mine, but I can't see yours. So actually, I would love to see yours. What you could do is take a picture. We'll take a quick minute right now. Take a picture with those who, are, who uh, you're watching with uh, at home or whoever or with your dogs or whoever you're watching with. Uh, cats, too. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not against cat people. If you have cats, take a picture with them, too, if you're watching the service with them. And go ahead and put it on Facebook or Instagram. Tag us at CBC Madeira. We'd love to see you. If you're in your Easter best and you're, you're, you're decked out to the nines, we would love to see that. If you're still in sweats, no judgment. We, that's okay. We, we love it, too. The holier the sweats, the better. You know what I mean? And that sounds weird. Um, nope, don't mean that. Just mean make sure, you, make sure you're fully clothed in your pictures before you post them and tag us. All right, I'm going to move on. That got real crazy just for a second. But I, I, do, want, I, I do know that uh, seeing you would be so much better. So please let us see your face. And, um, you know, it reminds me of the saying, seeing is believing. You've heard that saying? Seeing is believing. And a lot of people in the church don't like that. 
that saying because they believe it contradicts our faith. Um, you know, as if we could see, we would stop believing, or we would only we'd only believe if we see. But can I tell you something that I want to I want to talk about on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday? I want to make a statement here, and maybe it's it's controversial for you, but I don't think that it is. I really want to make this statement here that if the disciples had not seen, they would not have believed. Can I say it again? If they had not seen they would not have believed. If they didn't see Jesus alive after his death on the cross, they would not have believed. How do we know this? Because they were hiding and running and behind closed doors. They did not believe that Jesus had risen from the dead unless they had seen him. So there's something about seeing that is believing. That's what I want to speak to us about today. What they had seen. In fact, if you're going to title the message, you're going to make a note here, put what they have seen, what they have seen as the title of this message. We're going to be reading out of John chapter 20. You can turn with me there. We'll be starting in verse 1. And if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can go ahead and follow along there, opening the app, clicking, clicking on the more tab and then on events. And if you're, if you're locally watching, Central Valley Church will pop up as one of the churches that you can be following along in the app. Uh, if you're watching from somewhere else that's not local, you can just search for Central Valley Church and you should be able to find us there uh, in the app. So let's go ahead and begin to read, starting in verse 1. John chapter 20 says this, Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw, somebody say saw, that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John, but John's speaking of himself, so he's not going to name himself. Just a little humility there. And he said to them, they have taken, the, and she had said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. This is John, a little humble brag. He's saying, I'm faster than that Peter. I'm faster than the old man, right? Even though he wasn't old. And verse 5 says, And stooping to look in, he saw, say saw, the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, who finally caught up, following John, and went directly into the tomb. And he saw, say saw, the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which uh, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For, it, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let's go ahead and pray together right now. Lord, we ask in this moment, this day, a day of celebration and rejoicing, that you would open up our eyes to see you, open up our ears to hear you, open our hearts to receive what you have for us and what's in store for us. We ask, God, that you would remove all the other distractions and obstacles and barriers that would hinder us from receiving the word that you have for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So what's happening here? It's Sunday. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus, presumably to either mourn or pay her respects, and sees that the stone has been rolled away and runs to tell the disciples that someone had, had moved his body. The first thing that I notice here, her first response is not, Jesus has raised from the dead. She did not think that, even though Jesus had said countless times he was going to be killed and be resurrected. But her first thing, what she saw, what she observed, drew her conclusion. And so she assumed someone had opened up the tomb and moved his body. For her and the rest of the disciples, they were only able to see that their teacher and their master had died 
and was gone. All of their hopes had been dashed. Everything that they were hoping for, for revolution and freedom from the oppression of Roman control, had been removed at his death, and that's the only thing they could see. They thought it was final, and everything else was done. They could not see the hope that he tried to give them before he went to the cross. So she tells Peter and John, to, and they ran to the tomb to see for themselves. Now, in the ten verses that I just read to you, there are four times that we see the word saw. Four times. If you want to highlight them, I encourage you, if you have your Bibles or even in your Bible app, go back and highlight every time the word saw is used. It's in verse 1, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 8. Go ahead and highlight those. The first one is when Mary sees the, the stone rolled away. Then the second time is when John runs up. He gets to the, the start of the tomb or the entrance of the tomb. He stops, looks in, and he just sees. Then when Peter runs past John into the tomb, he saw. And then finally, John again goes into the tomb for himself, and he saw. And the Bible says he believed. Now, it might appear that all four of these times, the same word is being used, right? In English, it is the same word, saw. But in Greek, the original language, it is not the same word that's being used there for all four of those saw. In fact, there are three different words that are being translated as saw, and because of that, we might miss what's going on here in this profound moment as they encounter the empty tomb for the first time. The empty tomb. You know, as I, as I preach right now to basically an empty room, I feel okay with it. Maybe you heard a pastor say this already, but I'm okay that this room is empty because the tomb is also empty, and I'm okay with that. Hashtag, I stole that from somebody else, but I think it's still good. Even though this room is empty, that's okay because the tomb is empty. And so they encounter the empty tomb for the first time, and there's something significant here that we could miss if we just read past what they saw. So my prayer on this Resurrection Sunday that we would stop here in this moment and evaluate what did they see and what was significant about what they saw. And my prayer is that we will find ourselves in this story and their responses to what they saw. Now, let's look at the first saw. Let's look at it. This is the saw that is repeated twice. So there's Four saws, but there's only three different words, and the first one is repeated twice. Now, I'm going to break, break one of my preaching rules that I've heard passed down from professors and teachers, is, uh, is that you never really talk about Greek. You never talk about the original language in your sermon, because typically no one really cares about all of that. Uh, they say that Greek is like underwear. You should have it, you should use it, but no one should see it. And so I'm breaking one of those rules right now, uh, but I think it's vitally important. I think it makes the point of, what, of what's really happening on this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday. And so I'm going to break the rule and let you in uh, to the uh, Greek original language. The first one for saw in the Greek is found in verse 1 and verse 5, and it's blepo. You're already learning Greek. This is like higher education stuff right here. I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm helping somebody. Blepo. Go ahead and say blepo in your house. Blepo. So I, I kind of put an Italian spin on it. Uh, blepo. It means to see. Like, basically, to see. Like, if someone said, hey, did you watch that new show on Netflix? You're like, yeah, I saw that. Ah, blepo that. I saw. I, I, it's what you think it would mean, right? I saw it. It just means that they saw. So when Mary was walking up, and she saw the stone rolled away. She, she literally saw it. When John ran to the tomb and poked his head in, he just saw that stuff was there. The, the next saw that we see in the passage is Peter, who finally catches up with John at the tomb and runs right past him and goes in to see that the linen cloths are folded up in one area and the face cloth is folded and laying in another area. And that word... Is theoreo. Theoreo. It means to observe and to scrutinize. So when Peter ran into the tomb, 
He wasn't going in just to see what, what's going on. He ran in with like a CSI Jerusalem idea. Like, I'm going in because I've been told by Mary that someone who has taken my Lord's, my master's body and moved it, and I'm going to figure out what's going on here. I'm going to observe the situation. I'm going to contemplate and think about what's happening here, and I'm going to scrutinize everything that I'm seeing to, cho- to, to, to determine whether she's right or she's wrong. He's going in with a very logical, cerebral approach to the tomb. Like, he's there. I'm going to figure out who stole the body, right? That is the kind of see or the saw that he saw. This observation, this I'm going to put the pieces together and I'm going to find out I want the facts and just the facts. I'm running straight in. I'm headlong into the tomb. I'm going to assess. I'm, I'm doing fingerprints, uh, even though that didn't. I'm doing DNA tests. I don't know how he did it, but he just was like, I'm going to figure this out. That's how he ran in with it. And finally, the fourth saw that we see is John. The second time, he actually steps into the tomb, and he, he steps in fully, and he saw, and the word is Edo. Edo. That means to understand and to perceive the significance of something. So when he first stepped out and just poked his head in, he saw something materialistic there. Some material things were in the tomb, and he just was like, okay. Then he steps in, and after he steps in, he looks closer and he perceives what's going on. He understands the significance of the situation, and it says he believed. What what does that mean? He understands in his heart, Jesus has risen from the dead. Why would a grave robber, why would somebody who's going to move his body, take off his grave clothes and fold them nicely and take his face cloth and set it over and fold it somewhere nicely if they were stealing his body? John perceived, he saw, and understood the significance of that moment. He understood the significance of what was going on there. Like, ah, I see. I understand now what's going on. Now, why am I talking about these three different words translated as saw in this passage of Scripture on Easter Sunday? Well, I think they give us a glimpse into how we see the very important and significant day in history, Jesus rising from the dead. I think that no matter who you are or where you're from, I just thought about, a, is that Backstreet Boys? You sing that? Who you are, where you, I'm getting distracted. No matter where you are, who you are, or where you're, where you're at on this faith journey with Jesus, or whether you even say that you're a Christian or not, I think that this snapshot of the first encounter with Jesus' tomb encompasses how we as a people approach this day and this event in history. Let me explain. I think that if you approach Easter or Resurrection Sunday as just a a holiday, it's just another day on the calendar. It's a day that people give Easter baskets and eat chocolate-covered bunnies and, and, and kids do Easter egg hunts. If it's just another day, it's just a day like any other. It's You even might recognize that Christians celebrate it as the resurrection of their Lord, but that really doesn't mean too much to you. Then you might be looking at the tomb like blepo. You see it. You see that there's a day, a day called Easter. People walking around on goofy with goofy uh, rabbit ears on, and you're like, okay, great. I get time off. Like, it's fine. Right? You might be looking at it that way. You see it, it's there, but it has no real significance to you beyond another holiday on the calendar. Or, if you're approaching it like Peter approached the tomb, and let me remind you, he ran into it. He didn't wait outside. He he dove straight in. He began to look at it with scrutiny. If that's you, he, you know, he, he approached it. Like this, and if you approach Easter like Peter, who ran in and was very logical in his approach and very cerebral, was very like, I'm going to find the facts and I'm just going to figure this thing out, then you might approach the church in the same way that you might believe in God, but you approach him mainly with your heart or mainly with your head and not your heart. 
For you, maybe the resurrection isn't logical and isn't really that important. Churches and following God and saying you believe in God is about being a good person, being, doing moral things and being morally upright. But there's no real power in it. There's no real life-changing significance in it. There's no intimate relationship with it. You approach it very headstrong and logical. And yet your heart is far from the Lord. Potentially, you approach it and you, you have faith. You believe in God. But you approach your faith and you even approach the church without ever engaging your heart and ever allowing God to touch your heart. You're there, but you haven't seen the significance of this event. And finally, there's the second look of John where he's there. And this is what I pray that all of us, either we're there now or that you will get to this look that John gave when he saw the second look. In this second look, he understood and he perceived the significance of what he saw. He saw that Jesus had risen from the dead. And if the grave was empty because Jesus had risen, then everything changes. Everything has shifted. The dynamic of what we understand of life has been moved, and now there is life forevermore in Jesus because now he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And my heart is that you'll see the significance of this day that happened over 2,000 years ago that we're celebrating right now. That Jesus died as the sacrifice to wipe away the sins of the world, including your own sin. That He died for you and for me, and He rose from the dead three days later, signifying that He's God, that He's King, that He's our Savior. That in Him, and Him alone, there is life, there is freedom, there is hope, there is redemption, there is adoption, and there is eternity with Him. This is the day that we celebrate the fact that He has given us life because He lives. A Jesus that stayed in the tomb cannot promise us a life with Him for eternity. He cannot promise us transformation from darkness into light, from death into life, if He stayed dead. And so we understand this day signifies to us that those of us who've looked a second time, who've looked a little closer, who've gone in a little deeper, we understand what this day represents. We understand and perceive the significance of what's happening because the tomb is empty. Because the tomb is empty. Now, if you're looking at the empty tomb this morning like John saw it the second time, then you're rejoicing with me because you understand the significance of today and that you have life in Jesus and freedom in Jesus and you have hope for transformation in Jesus. But what happens, what if you're looking at the tomb through the other two lenses, the oreo or blepo? What do, you, what do you do? First, if you're looking at Easter as just another holiday, perceiving it just as it is, like John perceived the tomb that was there when he first approached, then my, then my call to you today is to take a second look. Take a second look like John did. Go in a little deeper and see and understand the significance of what happened on this day over 2,000 years ago. Put your hope and trust in Jesus, the risen King, that He came to redeem you. He came to to adopt you. I love the adoption language that we see throughout the New Testament because some of us come from broken families or broken homes or, or, or tough situations or families of origin that are just messed up and we, figure, we try to figure, will I ever be different? Will I ever change? Will I, I'm just going to repeat the, the problems of my family history past and I'm just like my dad or just like my grandfather. I'm just like my mom or my grandmother. I'm like my aunts. And they're all messed up and we're all jacked up. What hope do I have? Can I tell you that Jesus came to adopt you into the family of God and says, I'll give you a father who you can mim mimic and recognize. I'll, if you look to me, I'll show you the father. And, and if you live like me, then you are a part of my family. I want to give you a new hope and a new future. I'm going to give you a new family of origin where you don't have to say my past still has control over me because you now have a future in Him. This is the God that we serve, and I want you to take a second look at Him and take a second look at this day 
Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and understand that Jesus is the one who has defeated death, and he can defeat the death that is in you and the brokenness and the sin that's in you if you'll put your hope and trust in him. This is the God that we serve. He can save you from your sin, and he can heal your brokenness. Put your life in his hands. Now, if you're looking at the tomb like Peter did, then you need fresh eyes, and you need a new encounter with Jesus. If church has become only cerebral, logical, and you've been working in your head, you worship God with all of your mind, but not with all of your heart or all of your soul or all of your strength, then you need to have a new encounter with Jesus. You need to have it. We see Peter. In Peter's case, John chapter 20 and chapter 21 tells us that Peter encountered Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, and yet still struggled to believe. Some of us have been in church our whole lives, encountering God every Sunday and yet never feeling anything on the inside of us, never understanding the magnitude of His glory in our lives and the fact that His presence can change anything in a moment. And yet we are still there and our hearts have become dull or even hardened to the move of God in our lives. And if we can't understand it with our minds, then we don't really want to understand it at all. And yet Peter... We see him seeing the risen Jesus three times, and yet in chapter 21 of John, it says that he's gone back to what he knows. He's gone back to fishing. He's decided, you know what, I can't figure this out. I don't know what this is all about. I'm going to go back to what's familiar. Three times in the presence he saw. Every time when he saw Jesus, other disciples were with him and around him. They believed, and yet he still struggled to believe. Maybe Peter was so disappointed in himself for denying Christ before Jesus went to the cross that he couldn't believe that Jesus would come back and welcome him back into the family of God. In John 21, that's when we see Peter go back to fishing. He wasn't seeing it, so he returned to what he knew, which was kind of a pattern for Peter, always looking at the past to define his today. So what shifted for Peter's what shifted in Peter to change his perspective? Well, John 21 tells us that he had an intimate encounter with Jesus. When he was fishing, Jesus comes upon the shore and says, Children, as he calls out to Peter and John and those who are fishing with him, the other disciples who said, I'll go with you, because Peter was a leader. And he took other people, other disciples with him to fish. He says, Children, have you caught anything? They've been fishing all night. They say no. He tells them, Cast your net on the other side. And when they do, their nets are filled. And it, it reminds Peter and John and James the first time they encountered Jesus when they were fishing all night and caught no fish. And he told them to cast their nets on the other side. It comes full circle now. And John says, he turns to Peter and says, it's Jesus. Peter grabs his clothes, puts them on, jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. And Jesus has this intimate encounter with him. He makes him breakfast. And asks him, do you love me? Three times he asks him, do you love me? He has an intimate connection. Why? Because he denied Jesus three times before the cross. And now Jesus is reinstituting him back into his place and his calling of God in his life by reminding him, yes, you do love me. Now tend my sheep, feed my sheep, care for my sheep. He is reestablishing the call of God in his life. Peter has this intimate encounter with Jesus. If you're looking at the empty tomb like Peter did, you need to have a new personal encounter with Jesus where he can come to you, where he can speak to you and restore you and establish the call of God on your, on your life regardless of the pain of your past or the disappointments you faced. I'm sure that Peter approached the tomb the way he did, possibly because of the pain of his past or the disappointments in himself or even in others. And even in, up to that point, disappointed in Jesus because Jesus had died on the cross. He was so grieved, so disappointed in all of these things. But Jesus wouldn't leave him there. And, he wouldn't, and he's not going to leave you there if you'll respond to him when he calls you. So today, amidst all the family stuff that you do or 
the Easter egg hunt you put on for kids or whatever you're making and whatever you're going to do the rest of today, I want you to just take a moment to find a quiet place, to get alone with Jesus, to sit in silence by yourself and begin to ask the Lord, Jesus, would you come and speak to me? Would you come and have an intimate meeting and encounter with me right now? I need to know your voice. I need to feel your touch on my life. God, transform me from the inside out. Touch my heart, oh God, and make it new. That's my call for all of us who encounter the tomb like Jesus, like uh, Peter did, of Jesus' tomb. I want you to find a quiet place on this Resurrection Sunday and call out to God. He hasn't given up on you, even if you've given up on yourself. He still pursues you. He still loves you. He still wants a relationship with you. And he wants to remind you that you are a child of God when you belong to him. And he wants to remind you of the call of God on your life. Don't turn from him. Give him your heart and let him transform you. He has risen. Church, he is alive. And because of this, we have life abundantly in him. If we'll see him for who he is as our personal king and our savior. As the worship team comes forward, I want to close out in this time of prayer together. I want to pray with you today. Wherever you are, wherever you find yourself today, how you see the significance of today matters. And God is wanting us to see the dramatic shift that today holds for us and the world. Today signifies the fact that Jesus is alive, that he did rise from the grave, and he's given us hope forevermore. So if you're at home right now and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I just want to pray with you. If you'll repeat these words after me, say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. I recognize you and see you for who you are. You are my king. You are my savior. You are my God. Come and change me from the inside out. Transform me on this journey. I'm willing to follow you no matter what, no matter where you lead. Set me free from my sin and give me life in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer, please let us know. Write a comment here or send us a message so that we know how to continue to pray with you and for you on this journey of faith. And I want to encourage the rest of us to have a life that celebrates the fact that Jesus is alive, not just on one day a year, but every day throughout the year, because he is on the throne. He is alive. And we love to be in his presence. We love to be with him. We love to hear his voice. We long to see his face. And church, I just want to encourage you that Jesus is with you. He loves you. Let's celebrate together what God has done for us through his sacrifice and the fact that he is alive. Amen. Amen. As we sing this worship song together, I want to rejoice in the fact that God is with us right now. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We honor you on this day, this Resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday, the day that you conquered death and that you set us free. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.